how this is how the G8 looked like 3,500 years ago. Actually, it's, it was the G9 if you wanted to be precise. It's the known world, the civilized world that actually traded with each other. And the names will be familiar to you. There is Haijawa Hai, is actually uh, the Mycenaean. Uh, there was the Minoans, uh, the Hittites, the Mitannis, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and of course the Egyptians. And by this time, the Egyptians were already 3,500 years into their civilization. That's longer than everything that's happened between the time of Jesus Christ and today. And just as all of us in this room are from corporations with long histories, jobs that you feel comfortable with, skills that you've honed over the years, the mindset in that period was that life was more of the same. If a thousand years from now we were to examine this period that we're going through today, archaeologists will probably ask themselves, was America and China actually trading with each other? Were they actually the world's largest traders of each other, or were they at war with each other? It's very difficult to say. And so it was in that period, all of these, all of these uh, communities, they weren't countries as, as such, uh, traded very much with each other, but were always bickering with each other as well. And then there came that one year, 1176 BC. That war suddenly came to an end. Suddenly. And it's interesting that something can happen over centuries and then end suddenly in that way. And yet, you can see it coming. You can see the famines, you can see the earthquakes, you can see the problems that these um, you know, communities have with each other and so on. And then when it comes, it comes in a very interesting way. The Egyptians blame the so-called sea people and to this day, historians aren't agreed on what exactly this people were really like where they were from and you know what sort of battle where they were wearing to you know make such a big difference in such a short time. 3,500 years of history finished in 50 years or so. What was happening in that period was that the world as we know it today, civilization as we know it, was going through a transition from the Bronze Age into what eventually became known as the Iron Age. Equipment that was <laughs> definitive in a period around which entire civilizations were organized, were filled the land, <coughs> grew huge agriculture, built huge cities, started to change suddenly. But this period of transition was very, very interesting because this was the time a number of things happened which defines us today. The Lycenians, who are in what is called Turkey today, uh, originated the idea of a coin. And before this, a lot of the transactions that were taking place, and mind you, the world was a highly sophisticated trading um, civilization. All of these countries traded with each other just as we do today. But the idea of having a token in order to facilitate this trade came just towards the end of the Bronze Age. And this particular coin, you will see them in the London Museum and also uh, in the new uh, Louvre in Abu Dhabi, very interesting. It's a combination of gold and silver, and uh, later on, when the Romans incorporated the same type of tokens, 
they, they change the composition of silver and gold uh, to you know, give the price the value and make it possible for them to pay their soldiers and so on. So it's very interesting, but the concept of a token. This is also the period where a number of civilizations came right one after the other and started to shape the structure of society that gives us the stability that we have today. All of us know the, the uh, Greek civilization. Now, the Greeks weren't one country or one place. They were like 160 odd uh, city-states, uh, you know, dotted all along the Mediterranean coast. Uh, all of them cantankerous and fighting with each other. And this idea of civilization and, and democracy uh, and Plato and so on that we seem to think about the Greeks uh, is actually quite anathema to what actually happened in that period. Yes, there were those who were intellectuals, but most of the time they were actually fighting with each other. And the person who gave Greek civilization its grandeur and its relevance to history uh, actually came from Northern Greek. It's almost like uh, if Singapore is uh, the definitive civilization for Southeast Asia today, the person who eventually makes Singapore great is from the north in Malaysia or something like that, coming down to make a difference. And that was Philip uh, and then his son, uh, who became known as Alexander the Great. Macedonians came down, united all of Greece, and what is really interesting is, internationalized it and created this thing called the Greek Empire that took over all of the known world at that time. The operating principle there was speed. In 12 short years, a young man at the age of 20 went out to the east and united all of the civilizations that was known at that point in time. And how was he able to do that uh, in 12 short years? We ask ourselves today, how is it that a company called Facebook or Twitter or, or Amazon uh, can garner 200 million customers or 2.5 billion uh, uh, users uh, in 10 short years. So it was the same sort of principles that were in operation uh, at that time. But as soon as Alexander died, you, as you all know, uh, that empire that he built became fragmented. Uh, first among his own soldiers and then later on they went back to the roots of the uh, communities that they belonged to. Then it depended on the Romans coming in and building on that uh, score of civilization. And the Romans introduced something which didn't exist until then. Until then, a lot of the civilization was communal, was tribal, was, was uh, specific to location. The Romans introduced the concept of citizenship to non-Romans. And by that, they strengthened the ability to move their, uh, their soldiers to other parts of far away from uh, Rome uh, and, and create a, a community and a civilization that was able to survive uh, many, many centuries after that. There's another thing, another phenomenon that was happening in that period, and that was the rise of religions. Many of the known religions that eventually became global religions that we know today commenced in that period between the Bronze and the Iron Age. You have the Chinese religions, Taoism, and then you have Confucianism in the North, um, which were a little bit more codified, which was a little bit more um, structured uh, in order to create harmony in society and so on. And this was during the warring period in China. Religion had a very interesting um, effect, a theme, which I today actually associate with blockchain. And the reason I do that is because religion carried a number of concepts that enable society to interact with each other and created um, unity and harmony that, that, uh, that we now know today, that, that actually went beyond uh, racial or, or social and had um, shared objectives and so on put into a concept, a capsule as it were. The Indians um, had a longer religious history, but they had not written it down until about 9th century BC. And then uh, eventually 
the big epics, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana were written down, and then by the time you reach 4, 4 BC, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, which was a massive book, uh, written down. And the Buddhists introduced this concept where you actually create uh, values by storytelling. And that was something that was missing in the East Asian cultures, and then they adopted that and it became uh, even more international than it is today. The Christians were very interesting in that the first 300 years of Christianity, uh, there was a lot of different ideas running around. And in the first 300 years, they were persecuted so much that they didn't know uh, how these ideas were differing from each other. Just like today, if you look at how blockchain is evolving, uh, there's so many different variations, so many forking, so many splitting of ideas in the blockchain world that uh, we don't know which one will eventually dominate. So in the Christian tradition, what happened was there was a meeting in the 300 um, years after Christ where in Nicaea, they got together and said, let's agree on what um, uh, the, the, the core tenets of uh, this religion should be. And then that went on to uh, define that religion. But something about that ability to get together to discuss and to uh, debate and then come up with agreed uh, forms of thinking uh, continued into Western civilization and was, became the, the basis of the university culture, the learning culture, uh, and the civilizations that evolved after that. Something else that defined this period was that man was starting to use um, uh, metals which were an amalgamation of different uh, metals that was available at that time. Up to this point, civilization had been known, uh, or rather had been created around just nine different uh, core metals. But at, by the time we reached the end of the Bronze Age, we were starting to work with amalgamation. So the Bronze Age itself was actually an amalgamation of copper and tin. And these two uh, metals were actually found in different places, and that's what facilitated trade. And later we started to work on iron, and iron doesn't occur in its natural form anywhere except in the human body. So this whole idea of being able to extract iron uh, through the use of coal uh, defined how we were building civilization. So at the back of our minds, we look at not just how society was coming together, but the way in which we structured, the way in which we associated with each other, the way in which we built armies that were able to move quickly and, and, and be able to uh, conquer new territories had a lot to do with the raw material that, we, that was available to us. There's one religion that I had not mentioned yet, and that was Islam. That came about 600 years well at the very end of the Bronze Age. While all the other religions were structured around um, the hierarchy of the religion, where the decision makers sat at the top of the religion, Islam had a far more democratic process. Christianity, for example, uh, right after the Bronze Age, went into what is called a dark age, where religion was uh, the purview of those who spoke and wrote Latin, and 95% of the population was uneducated and was dependent on these 5% who were. Whereas in Islam, um, they taught their people to memorize the whole Quran, which the Prophet had, and you could become a Muslim just by uh, subscribing to five very basic values. Uh, and if you share those five values, uh, you were one of them, and that created the ability to be able to export this religion uh, eventually that came to define what we call the Silk Road today. So while the Chinese are trying to say that the Belt and Road is their creation, actually the, the religion that facilitated the Silk Road was the Muslims. And in fact, not just the Silk Road, but if you go into uh, the northern African territories where the where the um, uh, deserts are, they also created the, the camel trails. So they were they just created the arteries that eventually became uh, the trade routes that we know today. And that artery depended a lot on trust, on integrity, and on community. So trust that we will not cheat each other. Integrity in that the, the, the scales that we use are. Uh, 
uh, reliable and community that we belong to the same community regardless of uh, which uh, you know uh, tribe we belong to right through the, the Silk Road. And even this morning, if you go to Beijing and you had breakfast, the Mian Pao, the Youtiao, the, the Cha Ro, uh, they all find the origins uh, in the Silk Road. And, and right down to, to the west, if you go to Timbuktu, uh, so many of the documentations were traded uh, by the Arab and the Muslim traders in, in its time. And then we see the Mongolian Empire the world's largest empire ever known. The defining principle that enabled these sudden developments, and this happened over a 100 year period or less uh, in, the 12, uh, in, the, in the 13th century, uh, where the Mongolians were able to conquer so much of the world because they, they, like the Muslims, carried their traditions lightly and were able to create federations that the Romans had uh, perfected, which uh, comprised a lot of different people and different communities um, that were not their own people. Another development, the printing press. Johann Kaltung Gattenberg, who, act, who, who, who invented the printing press, was an iron man, was an iron smith. So this is the, by the time we got to the 1500s, we're talking about the impact of iron on human civilization. Within 50 years of inventing the printing press and writing in the vernacular language of the local community, the Germans in this case, a, pro, um, a priest called Martin Luther was able to put 99 theses on the wall to challenge the Catholic Church as he knew it at that time and create a huge movement that eventually became the Protestant movement and created yet another Talk, as you were in the Christian church. What do you think was the first most popular publications that were disseminated um, from the origins of the printing press? What? Bible. Bible? Uh, no, actually it was pornography. <laughs> okay? Yes, there were very good Bibles uh, printed and actually the Bible tradition actually came from the Muslim tradition of uh, coming up with very beautiful um, uh, Qurans um, that, that uses uh, calligraphy and so on. But uh, the, the, ironically, the, the, first, um, the, the first use of popular press was to, uh, to disseminate the lowest possible common denominator uh, in human society, which is pornography. Uh, and then came Christianity, and then came the sciences. By the time the journals got printed, uh, that was 150 years after the, 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 the start of the, um, of the uh, printing press. And so it was that um, after the printing press, what the printing press did is similar to what the internet is doing to us. It changes the way we associate, we learn, and we transmit values, cultures, knowledge, and so on. And uh, the defining uh, institution after the printing press was the Royal Society, because there was when the scientific community were able to get together and start a process where both chemists and physics were talking to each other, and from then on, we, it, we recognized a whole lot of other metals that define us today. So the aeroplanes that fly over the skies that you travel on are today made mostly of titanium, which did not exist uh, at that point in time. There is a, I'm building this, so you need to follow me uh, with this representation. There is a uh, social scientist called David Ronfeld, who is retired now, but he worked for a company called Red Corporation, which is still around, um, a think tank, by one of the um, uh, old um, uh, air, air, aircraft manufacturers. Um, and in 1992, he came up with this um, uh, concept, which I love very much and I use in my thinking and in my own mapping of how uh, the, the world is evolving. He said that uh, the world evolved in four phases. Tribal, institutional, markets, and networks. 
And remember, he was writing this in 1992, where we said that we're talking fax machine. Okay, the end of the Talex machine, and we just moved into the fax machine. And, and you can see from my description of that evolution from the Bronze Age into the, uh, uh, into the Iron Age and into society as we know today, there was a lot happening that was tribal. Uh, and it was the Romans who uh, changed uh, tribal identity of nationhood to a conceptual identity that was institutionalized, the concept of citizenship. Uh, and so on, right? And, uh, and then uh, the learning that came from the printing press and so on. In finance, we were tribal too. There are banks in Singapore which is called Overseas Chinese Banking Corporation, United Overseas Bank. These have a tribal orientation. And then it becomes institutionalized, where you don't have to be Chinese to be an employee in the bank or Chinese to be uh, a customer of the bank, and it becomes regional and global, and so on. I use this concept to think through some of the important developments in finance today. Think about LIBOR. LIBOR has a tribal origin in the streets of London, in Lombard, in Lime Street, where Organized that where societies like the Lloyds of London and lists of different kinds formulated, where traders got together and trusted each other because they were all English speaking white and uh, you know who, who were from the same social hierarchy, uh, and then that becomes um, institutionalized. In 1971, the British Bankers Association formalized the idea of a LIBOR. London interbank um, uh, market, right? And uh, when they formalized it, the tribal instincts still continue. It's still a community among friends, except that um, it serves a much different function and, and it grows. The, as human society evolved, uh, all of these uh, uh, phases sort of morph into each other until we get uh, a world today where, um, where we're actually a combination, an amalgamation of tribal, institutional, markets, and increasingly networks um, phenomenon uh, interacting with each other, dynamics interacting with each other. The, the problem though is when you're making that transition from one phase to another. So in 1971, when the British Bank Association set up the LIBOR infrastructure, the idea was to come up with a benchmark rate for three-month bank loans um, and to guide the, the, the cartel, as it were, to, in, in its lending practices at that time. In the year 2010, when the LIBOR crisis hit, when the British banks were being fined uh, and the reports were coming out saying that you know there was collusion and so on. Um, an event will happen in London on a Thursday evening, and on a Friday morning, I would be called uh, by Bloomberg or by BBC here in Singapore to provide what is called a soundbite, which is they want to keep talking about uh, the news last night until London opens again today. So they will call someone in Singapore, Hong Kong, and then. Uh, India and then the Middle East and then back to Europe and London uh, to the whole day. That's how the 24-hour news channels uh, keep uh, topics alive. And I was asked, um, what do you make of this uh, $5 trillion market? And I would say, what $5, million, why, what $5 trillion market? Uh, the LIMO rate sectors do not owe a duty of care to the traders. And, and that had to be established first. And if you read through the literature is, that is now available in all that has happened, in 2008, when, when uh, uh, Wall Street Journal first published the idea that there was collusion taking place in the marketplace, Andy George um, uh, didn't pay attention to what was going on, the, uh, the regulators in the UK. Um, you know, it, it was until, uh, uh, sorry, it was made Mervyn, uh, Davis, right? So uh, he didn't pay attention to, to what was going on until he received an email uh, from Timothy Gardner, 
right? And they didn't think it was important because um, the practices, the social norms in terms of how the tribal, the communal aspect, and the institutional aspect were morphing in each other was not defined. And that's why when you see a lot of the evils that were going on with the traders and the rate setters, they were informal, they were playful, they were like, life is normal. Uh, and they didn't understand that they had entered a different phase and a different set of responsibilities. And it took them seven years to make one prosecution and 60, billion, 60 million pounds uh, to get one prosecution, which today is now gone back to the courts because uh, it's considered unsafe. And the point here is also that, and the point of looking at it this way, is for, them, for us to understand that we're going to have this similar sort of disconsonance between one phase and another in, in the financial markets, in the industry that we know, as we move from the markets phenomena to the uh, networks phenomena. Another way to understand this transition from one phenomenon to another is to look at your own institutions. If the banks here have a Chinese origin, tribal, and then it gets institutionalized, some of their story is carried in the balance sheet. In the institutionalized, institutionalized format, a bank's business is essentially assets and liability. In the markets format, and this happened for a lot of the global banks, the balance sheet changes. 60, 70 percent of the profits are generated from the trading book, and it becomes less of a um, of an institutionalized business and more of a markets business. And some of you here work for multinationals who are the same. You actually make more money from your trading book than your core business. So you've actually moved a wall into a markets uh, dimension. And so as an animal. You are a different animal than you were when you were basically a asset liability book, uh, basic business carrying inventory. And all of this is going to change again when we go into the network phase of the industry. And uh, David Bronco's uh, conceptualization uh, carried different characteristics of each of these phases. It's not just tribal means, you know, uh, communal and stuff. But there were certain uh, defining elements uh, in each of these um, uh, phases. But I just want to touch on one of them, which is the risks that define each of these elements. In tribal, uh, the big crime is nepotism. You know, a father appointing his son as the chairman because he thinks that he's the smartest guy in the world, but actually he's not his son, right? Corruption in institution, meaning you get paid a salary, but you get a benefit that goes beyond your pay grade. Markets, the crime is different. It's, it's uh, exploitation. A trader, and some of you here are traders, you look for opportunities that come out of another person's weakness. Opportunity, exploit. Opportunity, exploit. When we finally get into the network phase, we're going to be seeing a very different type of crime. It's called deception. And I like this, like, this crime very much. Because in deception, all of us can relate to each other as if we all agree and know what the nature of the trade is, but none of us need to know each other's intention. And the crime is in the intention, is in the men's sphere, not in the actor's sphere. And when we get into that dimension, the nature of responsibility towards each other, the, the nature of the agreement, uh, and the nature of the fraud starts to change. And we will not recognize it until the first crime is detected. And so that is why we needed to understand the development of a crime like LIBOR through its different phases in the evolution of the industry as we know it. The finance industry is really bad about making these transitions. A lot of what the Bank for International Settlements is focused on today is the institutional form of the industry, where for every new activity in finance, they, they pour a capital charge. It's like you may be a traditional bank, capital charge. You're an asset
editor capital cloud, your uh, trading house capital cloud. That's trying to protect the institutional part of the business, but not understanding what the elements of the markets part of the business are supposed to be. And guess what? We are now moving into the uh, into the network uh, phase of civilization itself, and the banking regulator is not there yet. I use the same concept to explain a little bit about how Singapore thinks through innovation. And let me just go through back to that this, this slide. When Singapore thinks about innovation, it tries to protect the institutional phase of this industry's development. So when you take something like faster pay, for example, the real story of faster pay was the dichotomy between the MAS approach towards payments and what has now become the Sing, Gulf Sing, uh, you know, the, the IDA, the, the, the technology people in the government idea of payment. And there was a dichotomy because the MAS wanted to leave, wanted to ensure that all payments originated with banks. There is no Singapore equivalent of open bank, open banking as you have in the UK or PSD2 that you have in, in Europe. In fact, some countries that don't have this, like Hong Kong and South Africa, have pledged allegiance to open banking. But in Singapore, we still want the industry to be bank-centric. We are protecting the traditional institution instead of moving along with the phenomenon that the subsequent phases in evolution uh, dictates that we should. So, I want to start to crystallize this whole evolution into your institution, uh, the businesses that you operate in. When we talk about the network world, we all start with a lot of misconceptions and we, we all start with our own little uh, ideas of what the network world is. Let me start by saying what the network world is not. The network world is not technology. And since you're traders, you know this, because just in the last six years, we found that high frequency trading, for example, was supposed to change the world, was supposed to create winners and losers. We're supposed to make huge businesses around companies that were able to trade in the seconds, were able to create lines that go straight from Washington DC to Chicago. And exactly those institutions are failing now because the profit pool in high frequency trading has collapsed from about seven billion dollars to one billion dollars. So there's a lot of consolidation taking place, even as the technology is being made available to larger and larger sets of users, some of them working from home. And so you don't need to be an institution anymore to benefit from technology. In fact, technology destroys your institutions. The other thing that Network World is not, is it's not product. All of us remember Kodak. This could have been a Kodak meeting where in the, in the month that, that Kodak invented the digital film, that was in 1991, uh, right? Launches professional digital camera system. We all made the decision to continue selling the 35mm film. And Kodak continued to succeed, and the share price just kept going up for another nine years before it started falling. Product destroys you. And there are many, many banks today and, and companies. There are many, many banks and companies that think that the whole idea of a business in the network world is to roll out as many more products as possible. Products means inventory, product means cost, product means sales cost, product means distribution. 
product into your business. The network world is not about cost because the same cost advantages that you think you get is given to your competitor. And eventually it's a race to the bottom. And cost will kill you. And neither is the network world about the balance sheet. Some of you here are treasurers and some of you here are finance managers. You think that there's something in your balance sheet that needs to pop up that, uh, that makes a difference in the kind of businesses that you're in. But you will not find that answer. So what is the network world? The network world is three very important things. And just like the Egyptians for 3,500 years had thought that the world would be more of the same for the next 3,500 years, and it just disappeared within 50 years, many of you work in companies that will not be around in the next 10 years. The network world is the end of the cooperation as we know it. What is the substantive proof that this is happening? Mass amateurization. Those of you who look at your, or at your cost sheet and as their balance sheet and say that, how am I able to, to manage the cost structure of my business when other businesses are doing cheaper outside? Just think of it. And, and there's a professor called Clay uh, Stanley, I think. He, he, did it, he, he, he explained it this way. Um, imagine the Singapore National Day Parade. And if I was a newspaper and I hired 50 photographers to go out there and take photographs, they are my employees and they will take as many photographs as 20 photographers. But if I create a website or a, or a platform and introduced and invited everyone who attended the parade to put up the photographs, I get, I get access to a million photographs which I otherwise would not be able to get access to. And the best photograph might be the one photograph that was, was sent in by an anonymous person way down what is called the power curve. In other words, the incremental value to your business may actually come from outside the business. And you're not going to benefit from it unless you are absorbing from the outside coming in. Another phenomenon that is changing the network world, open source. Whenever I hear a large company say that they have opened yet another coding center in India uh, employing 2,000 employees, my first reaction is whatever for? You need just the five who can ace the competition on the thinking on the coding. Because there are 20 million coders out there who are sharing data, who are creating structure, solutions, platforms, applications that you can benefit from. And if you think that open source is anti-enterprise because it's not safe, all of that structure is being put in place already. And I like this picture of Linus Tolls with his little finger like that, uh, because he's calling the bluff of all of us. He's the most unfriendly person you can think of. And all of the coding for this thing called Linux, which he originated, is managed out of that one bedroom, that picture. And personalization. We all think that the biggest challenge for business today is to do what Amazon does, which is onboard customers at the lowest nominal cost. Or Google, it costs them almost nothing to onboard the customers and they can do whatever they want. That's platform. And so what happens is that all of us build internet sites and, and try to uh, onboard customers as quickly as possible. Right now, today, as I speak to you, that agenda is moving on to its next phase, and I call it personalization. The customer is now taking data back from their hands and taking control of it and interacting with each other 
outside your institution. And so, websites, apps, and so on, they are becoming increasingly ephemeral. Okay? They're not important in terms of, in terms of um, uh, their, their relevance to keeping your enterprise going. And when I think about a lot of the startups that you know proliferate and the conversations that you might be having with startups, I say that startups are not a technology phenomenon, they are a funding phenomenon. Because just think of the conversation. You are the CIO of a large corporation, a startup comes to see you. You are paid something between $12,000 and $30,000 a month. The startup founder, genius guy, should be paid that, but he's paid nothing. He's being, he's being funded by $2 million worth of uh, startup funding. And you are trying to keep your costs down, and so you onboard technology that you should have been originating yourself, but it will cost you far more because that's what you are paid. And you are actually absorbing the funding of the startup's um, you know, funds, basically. And in most cases, 90% of startup culture I call it actually my friend uh, Kim uh, said this and I'll never forget. It's just Java lipstick of things. Meaning all of us can be coders. All of us can have a business idea or something that needed to be changed and go out there and open an application. And we are way past that phenomenon now uh, for most of it. I'm not saying that there are not startups that are making a change in the world. There are startups that are in the frontier of their development. Uh, infrastructure plays today in AI, in data analytics, there are startups that you have to pay attention to. But the startups that I particularly like hearing from are those that are not interested in you as a customer because they are your competitors. They are the Greeks who will uh, take over the world. They are the Alexander the Great. The this end of the cooperation as we know it requires a certain, um, certain theme from us, a certain response from us. And this is the difficult part that I always have a problem communicating to corporates, which is that you need to externalize your business. And corporations say, of course we're externalizing our business. We've got our website, we're talking to our customers, we're collecting lots of data. Externalizing your business means that the data that exists outside your corporation is far more valuable than the data that exists inside your corporation. The days in which the data that exists inside your corporation is worth protecting are fast becoming over. The data that you have inside your corporation is historical. It's about you. It's not about the world that you need to understand. And I'm not talking big data, and you would notice that I haven't used uh, cliche phrases very much in this presentation. And that's because there's a lot in that data, that transaction, that community, that interaction that's taking place outside the organization that has got nothing to do with who you are. And you've got to figure out how you can plug into that, that ecosystem. And this is seen especially in the way in which large corporations think about APIs. Microsoft was good because they plugged into open source and they bought over uh, GitHub because they just wanted to plug into where the freelancers and the, and the, and the joy riders and, and just the open community was interacting and say to them, come in and, and help us build our products ourselves. So there are companies that are doing that and they're doing it well. And I'm not, this is not a plug for Microsoft because many other companies are doing this as well. Instead, what I find in Singapore is that companies and banks are very proud. We have got 50 of our uh, corporate uh, APIs pre-qualified working with us on Teams. No, your API has to be developed by an 11-year-old girl who's sitting next to the mother designing her first um, uh, um, game set on her phone. Your API should be developed by the condominium uh, managers who today still operate collecting checks uh, when we should have gone digital by today. Your API should be done by groups of people 
having fun with each other and saying, okay, let's, how do we organize ourselves and how do we connect back into an institution that can help us? And from there, we find that a lot of what you see on your balance sheet today starts looking very different. I spoke to the founders of, uh, of TransferWise um, and they were saying to me that from day one, they never had liquidity problems. They do $10 billion a month right now in, in uh, FX payments. Not a single day that they have uh, liquidity problems because all of their liquidity is out there for the customer to see. And while you are sitting on loss pro accounts and loss pro accounts and capital charges and so on, there's a new world developing in the network world where liquidity and the balance sheet is walking around with your customer. And the network phase is about personalization, not institutionalization. So when we think about things like identity, management, it's not that you validate the identity, it's the customer validates his identity for himself. And he validates his identity with all those he wants to validate it with. And disintermediation, because when your customers are talking to each other, they don't need to talk to you. So there's this thing going around called blockchain. And I said religion was probably one of the first blockchain ideas in the world that, that holds us together and create community. There are two blockchain conversations taking place today. If you went to any of the geek blockchain community, the conversation you hear will be very different from the blockchain communities that the banks set up. And I know there are banks here and I'm an Asian banker, make my living out of these banks, make my living telling these banks that they must be the right thing. So the blockchain that is changing the world is the one where young people are falling over themselves to try and figure out how do you build on the original idea of cryptocurrency. Remember the coin, the license, when they first started tokenizing trade? Well, today we're tokenizing interaction. And they're asking themselves, like, how much data should they co collect? Uh, what if I want uh, uh, one, one group of people want to transact far more data than another group of people? Can we form another subsect of religion? And so on. And this phenomenon will keep growing until it takes a life of its own. And it's going to leave all of you behind. You know, the way in which Constantinople became Christian was not as if the, the, the official message was not uh, was that he, he had a vision and all that stuff. The real reason is because his mother was Christian, his sister became Christian, his maid was Christian, his personal bodyguard was Christian, and he's like, this is getting scary. Right? And then he formalized the acceptance of the religion. So in this same way, a lot of these developments are going to grow around you and, and, uh, and take a life of its own that will define you until you're not able to resist it. The way in which the bankers are thinking about blockchain, something very interesting is going to happen. And that is, it's going to be blockchain killed by the compliance you think that the compliance department is going to allow you to allow a transaction where the identities of the participants are not pre-verified? Do you think that the compliance department is going to allow a $100 billion trade flow to take place without them having a look at it? No, they're not. And I've looked at just every single press release of blockchain initiatives from around the world, and all of them have nothing to do with blockchain. All of them are nothing more than, well, the most respectful thing you can say is it's a chair ledger, which is a natural transition from the days of the database. We're coming to a world where the World Wide Web, as we know it, and I have the pleasure of meeting 
the person who actually wrote the code for World Wide Web, this is Kevin Bernersley. Simple man, a simple protocol. And you know, to this day, he must be kicking himself because all of the billionaires who created Amazon, Google, and all that on top of that little protocol that he did where he, he allowed file transfer. The big thing about the Bitcoin value that went up to 19,000 last year was not that that Bitcoin was worth 19,000. I collect Bitcoins, uh, and I think there's something happening there. The big thing is that there were 2,000 cryptocurrencies by then. The big thing is that you can be an owner of a cryptocurrency yourself, originator yourself. And we're coming to a world where the protocol is, does not exist outside your ecosystem. The protocol exists in your hand, like a mobile phone. You decide the community that you create. You decide who you want to validate or not validate in your transaction. So imagine a world where any one of you who needs to make a payment just sends out a message and anybody in this room who wants to respond can respond and all of the elements required to make that payment from identity to credit quality of that person to liquidity to transaction occurs between individuals. I'm not saying that that world is going to come tomorrow or day after. I'm saying that we need a roadmap to know and to decide for ourselves that that's the world that we are heading towards despite ourselves. And every decision you make in a corporation has to take you to that world. All of these ideas is in a book that I will be publishing in January, so you are like a, a precursor to this. But it's a book that I hope that will help us think through this journey that we are all on. I like this phrase in, in uh, uh, Hemingway's uh, The Sun Also Rises. I mean, those of you who are in finance would have heard this phrase before. How do you go bankrupt? asked one of them. And the answer was two ways gradually and then suddenly. So, gradually in that you see it coming, suddenly is that the day will come. Thank you. Uh, can you give an example of a true disruptor? Yeah, so yeah, I, I want to answer two questions to that. Huh? So you, you have the peer-to-peer -peer players who are this disrupt, true disruptors. They were not asking for permission. Okay, that's one true disruptor. Uh, in, in the Southeast Asian context, I would say that Grab is a potential true disruptor. Okay, because uh, what they say is they have 140 million customers in um, in 12, 14 countries, something like that, right? 12, 12 14 countries around the, the Southeast Asian um, you know, space already. And here you are, you've got the regulators, the, 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 the central banks of all the different countries meeting every six months uh, for the last five years trying to set up a regional payment network. And, and here you have a platform that's already built that for them, right? So, um, the peer-to-peer -peer players, funnily enough, and I want to make this comment, is that uh, they had a false start. Because I'm now meeting some of them in China, in the UK, and so on. And um, they started by being disruptors because the borrowing and lending is between an individual and an individual. You don't need the bank, and it doesn't even carry the balance sheet itself. Right? It just matches people. But that agenda has uh, changed somewhat because a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer players uh, it became too easy to become a peer to peer player. A lot of fraud was taking place. The regulators have come in and started to clamp down on them. Um, and they themselves have started saying that they want to be like banks. Okay, so that space will evolve. Um, and so the error in the peer to peer disruptor is that, um, is that it's a false start, but the idea is still there uh, and it will uh, start again and morph uh, into a new format as personalization becomes more available. Now, as for the Grab uh, disruptor model, Grab is already to, uh, I, I, I mentioned Grab, but in China, on my phone, I have both Alipay and uh, WeChat. Not a single day do I need to carry uh, money. I, I promise you this, okay? And not only that, um, I, you know, uh, I, I use it for everything from shopping to pay the beggar, 
literally, and I see beggars having QR codes, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and I, would, I see pictures of these. Um, so so they're the ones um, pushing the frontier. And and my conversation with the Chinese regulators was like this: 2013, right? Uh, 2014. One year had passed since Alipay had started, and they've already been doing a few billion dollars, maybe 20 billion dollars by that time. Uh, and I was having lunch with the regulators, and they were saying, "How do you how do you manage a non-bank payment platform? So, do you know that Ali Alipay exists? Why are you asking me this question today? You know?" And basically, and then I said, "You know what about um, uh, what about a um, the, the concept of uh, um, you know non-bank uh, payment entity uh, deposit taking company?" And they said, "Oh, tell us more and stuff like that." And it was very interesting. So here was a case of, of a disruptor who had. Uh, created a market for themselves while the regulator was not watching. Uh, and they could do that in China because it starts from the provinces and it's not a national uh, uh, platform first and then it becomes too big and then they have to manage it themselves. So Grab was going to be that for Southeast Asia, but the regulators were there faster. So now the regulators are saying, you need to fulfill the following principles. Uh, you need to have money originated from a bank account because of KYC and so on. Uh, and so they're trying to make a disruptor back into a traditional institution. But that war is not over yet. But that's what a disruptor does. Um, well, all established businesses try to absorb um, rule changes, uh, but the rules keep changing on them. So in the same way that um, you know, a traditional bank today pretends that it is, uh, you know, it is uh, innovative and it is absorbing, uh, the network technology is digital, they love getting awards, we call the digital Bank, all that stuff. The Googles of the world and the Microsoft of the world are trying to keep that. But there is something to learn from uh, uh, Google and, and, uh, and Microsoft buying into Kaggle and Git and Arvik. Uh, 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 is that um, as they internalize these developments, you, you need to figure out how much of their traditional way of looking at businesses are changing. So um, Tim Berners Lee said to me, he said, um, the problem with these uh, platforms, Google and so on, is that they actually um, they actually fragment data. They they don't unify data. You know, the funny thing about the, the World Wide Web is supposed to liberate data. Uh, they they actually create silos rather than uh, break silos. So so while they buy into Git, what you don't want them to do is to create a silo community from there, uh, and that's not what's supposed to happen. All right. Well, we could talk about this a lot more, but please join me, join me in thanking Emmanuel for an amazing speech. <laughs>